Welcome back, everyone. I hope your meetings and connections were as productive as mine were. We have some uh, great folks here who are going to give us the report outs, and we hope to have uh, some time for some overall discussion uh, after the report outs from the three focus groups. Our first focus group that's going to report out is curriculum and field, and our co-chairs for this year are Trish Taylor and the Melissa McAllister. And so I think, first of all, we need to give them a big round of applause for all the work they've done in facilitating our discussions about curriculum and field today. This was a very active group. Everyone had something to contribute. So we're going to start here with new, then we have needed, and next. And thank you to Monique. She handled this computer, and she put everything up here. And so we're going to add as we go if we find some other ideas. So if you have some ideas as we go through here, please contribute them because it's a community effort. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Amy from Southern University at New Orleans. And I was part of this um, vibrant discussion and took notes on what was new in terms of curriculum and field and ad hoc presenter with you uh, this afternoon. So I'll highlight a few things and we'll review through the PowerPoint that was developed. But one of the things that sounded really interesting to me was that um, in Akron, Ohio, they're looking at secondary trauma and emotional intelligence in terms of um, 4E students and front CPS workers. Um, and some dissertation, dissertation research is suggesting a low rate of emotional management in child welfare. So they're integrating emotional intelligence and emotional management into um, their curriculum and into how they're training and preparing their 4E students, um, which sounded really interesting. We discussed a lot as well about online training and online field education courses, some of the challenges with that, some of the programs that are looking at making that transition to online field education. Um, and that sounds like some potential collaborative projects in terms of moving forward in that, in that front. Um, several states were reporting program redesigns. Um, one of them in, here in Texas was regarding their foster care and switching to more of what I was understanding a privatized based <coughs> foster care management system rather than public based and some of the anticipated um, successes and challenges with that. Um, another model that was discussed was more of a mobile workforce model where CPS workers are not being housed in a central agency but um, being stationed out to being more of a mobile type unit. We discussed some of the challenges of how that relates to practicum experience if there aren't workers in a specific office, as well as some of the things that were pointed out to be successes. Um, one of our, in Arizona, our, one of our faculty 4E instructors is housed in their protection agency, which seemed really unique in terms of structure and how that uh, gives direct access for field <coughs> learning experiences. We also discussed the use of mentorship and coaching to increase both the competency and the retention of 4E students and help them bridge that gap between the curriculum side and the hands-on learning experience, bridging the gap between um, knowledge and direct practice skills. Um, there was also shared success in terms of using foster care alumni in um, training and development for new foster care workers, foster parents, and DCFS training staff. Um, also on our new list, the Ohio New Program focusing on emotional intelligence, which we discussed. Foster care alumni being involved in agency organizations and training, um, piloting field within students' unit at CPS and researching the outcomes of that, um, looking at primary trauma and services for lay guys, lay, I can't talk, um, lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgendered youth and how that's an underserved population. Um, measuring competencies through online programs was a big part of our discussion. Um, we looked at technology, how a new technological era is here and how we can apply that to 4E. We looked at work, workforce training and field instruction, joint regional training and training of the trainers. We talked about the foster care redesign, the mobile units, um, looking at strength-based training for clinical supervision and applying more of a clinical supervision model to our 4E field education. Um, we talked about funding issues when we talked about um, I think this is maybe getting over into the needed, or should I share these? Um, the mentorship model connecting students with both alumni and um, current workers. Um, someone was sharing about a course emerging issues in child welfare and adding trauma-informed components of that, um, and motivating and recruiting MSW 
of these building structures. So there was a lot of discussion that was brought to the table in terms of what is new in the area of field. Anything you'd like to add? Needed. <laughs> we have needed go. <laughs> Hello, I'm Patty Saylor, Program Director for uh, the Bachelor of Social Work Program in Portales, New Mexico, and I got to do Needed, uh, which suits me really good because um, it's the easiest one to present money, staff, retention, training. <laughs> money, staff, <laughs> recruiting. Uh, three pages. Money, staff, <laughs> recruiting, and training. And, and then seriously, all that does is help. We, we need some measuring competencies for online field classes. Well, we need staff, money, training, you know, uh, all those sorts of things. So it, what's neat about it, I guess, is, is this is a really diverse group in the sense of uh, I came out of the child welfare uh, agencies 26 plus years and now in education and I can sort of see both sides of the coin and we still need money, we still need staff, we still need retention and training and with that it all goes into uh, one of the things that was talked about is how you integrate technology uh, with students and still maintain that quality of work, quality of education uh, they talked about a, total, a telecommunicating system in large communities and how all of a sudden now uh, the need uh, that workers have, uh, that they're working primarily from home, so they're like by themselves, they're doing all these sorts of things, and they don't have that wonderful peer support that we had when I was in the field. I mean, you could go down the hallway and there would be 10 of us all griping or needing 10 different things. And so at least we had that to fall back on. Um, the secondary trauma uh, issue, uh, there evidently is a great need uh, to address that with um, folks in the field and folks in education. And I didn't really realize it until I was listening to my colleagues talk and, and uh, we find that our young students, our bachelor students, we try to share some things within their junior year, and they look at us like, yeah, 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 that never happened, it won't happen, you know, those sorts of things. And you can say things like, children do die, uh, children are blah, 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 you know, whatever, and they get in field, and children do die, and blah, 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 and all of a sudden now that trauma is coming on them from whatever. So it's everywhere. Um, and I, I didn't realize that really was a, a big need to bet. Um, I can't see anything else other than money, <laughs> staff, <laughs> retention, and training. That even goes to foster parents. We, uh, uh, Patricia talked about foster parents get so tired of the same old training and I can remember doing foster care training a hundred years ago and we had uh, pencils and paper to put on the thing and, and we were in a poor state and so we didn't have this but we had something to write on and, and tonight we're going to talk about trauma and how kids will pee um, in the closet if they're scared or whatever you know and so uh, there, there's a great need I think to look at that. Did I miss anything? specific that you want uh, because all I kept hearing were the same things mm -hmm. all of us we just have needs of money we have needs of staff we have needs of way to keep <coughs> them. Uh, the curriculum needs to prepare the students to go into the field um, and then when they do go to work that we're getting them prepared on the educational part of it so there's a great need for that so if I missed anything speak now or for
Can I add one thing? I think one thing that we that a number of people talked about that people are struggling with is the a really mobile workforce that people are officing outside of the office and that is presenting issues for field placements. It's also presenting issues for the workforce and education and support in a lot of different ways. And it was kind of a need because people are struggling with it but don't necessarily know how to address it. Hi, my name is Tanya Murkabell. I am with the Greater New Orleans Region Department of Children and Family Services. I'm a foster care supervisor, a 4E supervisor, and coordinator of the 4E students for our region. And in talking about what's needed next in terms of field and curriculum, it was a culmination of everything we've already talked about. Um, but what I have is, let's see, let's see what's up here first. Work with states and all students to work jointly to set up kinds of decisions. Okay, so I'm gonna go with what I have, which is the mobile service um, unit. We talked about um, so many people, so many students, and, and everything being outsourced. Um, with the mobile service CPS, we look for results. Okay, hold on. Let me get my notes. Result-oriented work services was something that's being done in, in one of the states. And what it is is that there's so many um, of our workers who are now working out in the field rather than in the offices. And that is um, presenting some concerns with secondary trauma support because they don't have their colleagues right down the hall or their um, co-workers right down the hall when they can share about there has been a death on the unit or a child has died or something has happened. Now they're actually at home working and they just don't have that real-time support um, in terms of dealing with those kinds of concerns. At first, a lot of persons, uh, workers thought that it was a good thing to work from home, to work from different sites. But again, as these new issues started coming up, they're seeing that that disconnect is causing some real concerns. Um, the online field placement, a lot of instructors talked about that and the distance placements and how can they actually measure what's going on with um, their students while they're not there seeing them on a regular basis. And what we talked about is next is that we have to have some real basis of measurements for that. So there are persons who are working on actually seeing how that is impacting um, not only our workforce but our students also and how we can better um, work to make a better outcome for that. We talked about the um, in next measures we talked about as far as retention is concerned, um, how do we actually retain our 4E students after, after their placement time is up or after they've given back what they owe to us? Because when we look at what's happening next, we, our whole goal is to create a better informed and a better trained um, child welfare staff. And if we are losing them once they've given back what's needed, then that's a problem. So we're looking at in terms of finding a better mesh between class and field experience, class instruction and field experience to ensure that we're actually giving them, we're teaching them what's actually, what they're receiving, what's happening in the field. We talked about we can't do a whole lot about that money situation right now, but that would be nice um, in terms of actually keeping our students with us. Um, we talked about motivating and recruiting field instructors as um, um, when we look at what to do next, if we can continue to motivate and rec our field instructors, that would help a lot to actually meet some of those needs. Some of the different strategies to support supervisors to promote retention of 4E, um, of the 4E program is a collaboration that's going on between Title 4E and the actual child welfare force. So what's happening next is to continue to work on that process to see how we can uh, make these things happen better. And finally, uh, one of the big things that came up was preparing social workers for a disproportionate workforce, for a disproportionate population. And what's happening next is someone has already start, talked about working, partnering with the community. If we have um, persons who are, the workforce is not um, indicative of what the community is actually looking like, to actually partner with those community sites and have those workers go more into the community and get more of an experience from the persons that they're working with and let them actually give them more um, hands-on experience and how to relate and how to be better and culturally competent to work with their communities. Um, trying to inform curriculum, tested both in mental health and child welfare. And again, we're looking at how to actually measure the outcomes of what we need. Thank you. Our group discussed partnership and administration, and I'm going to let Michelle and Annette kind of give you an overview of what we discussed. Okay, this is partnership and administration. Looking at new, we 
we actually started out with the uh, diminishing population rate, which is new again every year as the population is, rate is changing for a variety of, of different reasons um, in many states. And also in Texas, uh, they had this year for the first, this is our first renewal of a five-year block contract with the state of Texas. And they're um, lowering the administrative um, time it takes to renew contracts and looking for new ways to um, standardize and make the administrative end of it easier for both universities and the state offices and their contract process. We had a um, person from the state of Delaware that brought up a totally new issue that uh, has not been come up before a lot and as far as the multi-state configuration. He's in the state of Delaware, a small state with not a university within the state. So he's looking at maybe trying to build a model that would include uh, a multi-state region and, and just talking about the complexities of, of what that brings to the table. And to add to that, uh, one of the concerns that he had is how do you draw 4E monies for uh, students who may attend a university in another state uh, but need to work, if you will, in Delaware. How do we go about fixing that so that, uh, and where do they train after they have gone through the educational piece? Uh, the online education, someone said it um, late here. How do you go about setting up, executing, monitoring, uh, field placements? which online education, but you have some good ideas, and I heard people saying, oh, we need to get with her, so I'm sure we will. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, people from Arkansas, I believe it was, talked about their differential response plan that they're building because they have such varied population within their state as far as how to go ahead and plan to, um, to address those needs. Yeah, and we, and here in Texas, we are starting this program, but we're calling it alternative response. And we are mimicking some models from other states, but we just don't know how quite to start this model. What are these conversations going to look like, and how are we going to change the, the thought processes of workers who have been in investigative mode for so many years? How are we going to get them to think differently? And finally, we did have some discussion on Title IV waivers. There are some states that have um, done some waivers or are in the process of waiting for a response back from the federal um, uh, people as far as something that they've submitted as, as a, a way to go ahead and continue the Title IV services in these changing times. Moving on to needed, we found um, a lot of these items are ongoing, so they fit kind of in, in our new and needed and next uh, categories all, but uh, one thing that the state of Texas is doing is developing a packet for new universities that are interested in, in contracting with the state to try and have an orientation packet ready and have all the forms and, and all the information together in order to reach out to uh, other universities and areas that may not be serviced at this at this time. Um, that goes along with developing a simpler process. Um, we had some discussion on revisiting the population rate, how that's calculated, and that dovetails in with um, NESW uh, Association where we could go ahead and do professional social work advocacy to go ahead and, and help change some of these things that are, or advocate for change that are not within our control, but we could certainly advocate at the state and federal levels for different changes. I believe that was also the piece, someone mentioned the rates being based on the 1996 rate and how do we get that changed uh, to reflect what is now? and tied in with our other group that meets here, National Evaluation. I know that's been an ongoing um, process and it's still needed and anybody interested in joining that process um, can certainly get on that group's email list. And the groups aren't mutually exclusive. You can uh, comment and, and 
and work with, with these groups and, and communicate during the year and involve yourself in the process. And another comment would be to go ahead and have a clearinghouse to share curriculum. And also, this wasn't mentioned in our group, but someone told me afterwards, a succession plan for new workers as we're facing a lot of retirements coming up in the child welfare workforce on how to build that succession plan for, for, for new people to come in and carry on the baton. And again, we go back to the impact of distance education, and you said it, how do we manage that? How do we um, define who's responsible? How do we draw the 4E monies? How do we go about placing? And really, what's next for distance education and how that's going to impact how we get people trained and developed? And with the whole explosion of the internet and the younger generation being so uh, electronically connected, there's been an erosion of geographic barriers, as we mentioned in Delaware. Like, where does, how do, how do we cope with uh, those blending lines, and how do we still provide services or draw down funds? Is there services that we can provide by internet uh, as we go more mobile? That's uh, a certain amount of information is traded electronically. How do we standardize, help each other in sharing? So we standardize curriculum, standardize the competency model, more sharing between the states who are not reinventing the wheels, or how do we get access to best practices as they're developed in the states? And uh, again, Texas reported that they're going to work on a more standardized template to go ahead. They've, they've gone to the five-year renewable contract without having a contractual paperwork every year. They're still going to be working more to standardize our renewal process to make, you know, to ease the administrative burden, which would ease cost on the state as they administer the 4 week program. I uh, just uh, spent a few minutes uh, on the PowerPoint and just develop what we discuss. okay? Um, we have uh, about 15 people in our group. Um, they gave wonderful input, and I uh, have free consultation from them. Uh, they don't charge me for the uh, questions. So wonderful. So, Nice thing about coming to the conference is that we can sell. So what we do in Texas, uh, as said one example, was new, okay? So what we're doing is that we have a project going on um, to do an administrative evaluation of the data uh, concerning Title IV graduates. Our focus is on retention and uh, also turnover. So we develop a few questions. Basically, we have three goals. One is that we want to create a centralized database for all PM Post uh, 2007 Title 40 graduates in Texas. We summarize data to get a clear picture of the 40 graduates to see where they are. And you also want to gain information concerning turnover and barrier to retention of this work within the Texas system. Can you see it from there? Okay? Good. We have a few questions after they graduate. What are we going to do? Okay, we don't know. Uh, so therefore, we launched this project. We raised eight questions. Question number one is, what was the average length of the time for the Title IV students to successfully complete their PSW and MSW degree program? Where, where are the Title IV graduate currently employed? They graduate, they went away. So we don't know where they are. So we're going to find out what percentage of the Title IV graduates have been promoted. Now that's a very challenging issue that we raise is the fact that Promotion could be good, but may not be good. I heard from the workers, and I got promoted. I only get about a couple hundred dollars, and the workload is right like this. <laughs> so, so that's a question you want to raise. Oh, okay. went too far. Of the Title 40 graduate who had worked for CPS, what percentage have been transferred to other areas? So we need to define turnover in addition to turning over is that the transfer. You transfer from CPS to APS, adult protection, so but same department or they transfer to as administrator. So that could be a sign, uh, how do you define turnover, okay? Number four, number five, did, the, uh, did they complete their postgraduate service requirement, payback, for example? If not, what were the reasons for non-completion? Number seven, what is the overall turnover rate for Title IV-E uh, graduate within the system? Number eight, are Title IV-E graduates who are no longer with GPS still working in the field of child welfare. They in child welfare, that means good, doesn't mean they have to work at CPS. So there's one thing in Texas. So I'm going to go over this, uh, what's new from other states, okay? 
Uh, I have to go fast here because I'm going to save uh, the slide later. Okay, these are some of the <coughs> presentation I had. So I use my PowerPoint uh, actually to do uh, some work here uh, to do a survey uh, for what's new. So I just talk about taxes. Okay. So for Nevada and Oregon, uh, I have typos here because I typo over there. Uh, Neil Gray posts basic skills at the university profession skills while in Title IV year programs. That means while they're in Title IV year, they also implement training uh, for Title IV year uh, workers in addition to the curriculum. In California, they address the skill development rather than the core. Okay? In Texas, they also do specialized course for court testimony, case management, working with the monetary clients as part of the BSW and MSW degree program. So what's needed? Well, the question is that how much retention is needed? Enough! So we propose that how do we address this issue? We launch cost benefit and cost effectiveness analysis to find out is it worth to do it? Okay, how much? But it's very dangerous, okay? I heard from the audience it could be very dangerous, okay? If the cost is much higher than the benefit, then I lost my job, okay? <laughs> Child and family review, how does 4 year versus non 4 year compare in terms of the case outcome, okay? Uh, we have to look at this nationally. The currently federal is revising the standard right now. So we, we haven't seen a new version, but it's coming out. What is different between child and 4 year and non child and 4 year based on outcome? Also, we address well-being. Well, child and 4 year address foster care and adoption, but they are also related to into other areas, for example, mental health, health, what are the well-being of the uh, individuals. Four years, do, uh, four years do not want to uh, want promotion. How to reward them monetary based on more quality being delivered. Okay, so they don't want to get promotion, more work, but how do we retain them? That's very important, right? Money doesn't speak for everything, okay? All right, and what is next? Well, we want to do cost-benefit analysis for 4 years. How much retention is enough? Ask the National Task Force to look into it. So I don't have to do the work. Sure, that's the work, okay? <laughs> uh, there's a National Task Force uh, 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 going on right now, and I'm part of it as well. So this afternoon, they're going to talk about it, okay? Uh, we also uh, want to propose to have a national data bank that we uh, collect all the outcome data but store into one area. So we can compare across all 50 states plus the territory. Uh, so we asked the National Task Force to look into this as well. Uh, they are free. Uh, we also want to look in, into organization, organization changes to support detention. We want um, the, uh, whoever is willing to complete the survey that Remember the eight question I posed? We developed a survey already. It's on Survey Monkey right now in Texas. We are going to implement this in uh, the later part in the summer or in the fall. Okay? Yeah, if you're interested, uh, contact me. I can send you a link and then you can replicate in your state or in your university. Basically, the survey to graduates. Uh, and also, we look into uh, the defined detention. What does, what does detention, de uh, detention mean? Uh, create university courses to support child welfare employees in addition to Title IV uh, training. So with that, do I miss anything uh, in my group? With that, thank you very much. <laughs> By the way, uh, Water is the reporter. I want to acknowledge him. Water is uh, from Pan America. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. Do we have, um, do we choose co-chairs for next year? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. From all the groups. Okay. Can, uh, curriculum and field, who are your co-chairs? Uh, Liz Winter and Christy Holt. Christy Holt. Wow. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you very much. How about uh, partnership and administration? Ah. And Jolyn. Mark. Mark Farley from Delaware Children, Youth, and Families. Great, great. Let's give them a hand for next year. <laughs> Any evaluation? Uh, the position is still vacant. Any volunteer? <laughs> <laughs> no pay job? Volunteer. <laughs>
Anyone who is interested in cochlear evaluation? How about someone from National? The, the National? Sir? Okay. 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 <laughs> okay. Thank you. Sarah. All right. All right. All right. Thank you. Good. Great. Okay. Um, let me get my pedometer. Okay. I told you in the beginning that uh, my name was Nancy Chafkin and that you were going to focus on an N and a C. You did an awesome job focusing on the N, what's new, what's needed, and what's next. Now I want you to take your pedometers and focus on the C. And the C's are, I want you to continue to connect. You can use this pedometer to walk all around and meet again and talk some more and continue all these conversations. I want you to con continue to connect. I want you to communicate. And I want you to collaborate. I think that is what will move us forward to the next steps if we will work together. We are all different. That is true, and it will not be easy. There are going to be some roadblocks in trying to make all of these collaborations and designing and evaluation or talking about uh, all the different curriculum or all the different even uh, partnership designs. But we can do it if we continue to connect and communicate and collaborate. So let's move forward and continue. Have a great meeting, great round table. And don't forget to uh, introduce yourselves, continue these conversations. I want to thank all of you for participating, and I particularly want to thank our, our, our roundtable uh, focus group co-chairs. Let's give a big hand uh, to our I will tell you that the notes or the PowerPoints will be posted on the website. And uh, also, we're videotaping, so this, uh, the summary of this session will also be posted uh, later in June, I believe. Usually, before July, I think, we usually get everything posted. And so, go forth, use that pedometer, and connect.